Good afternoon students. Welcome to today's lecture. I had some technical issues in the lab so I'm re-recording this lecture in my office. The following slide is probably the most important slide presented in the course. It summarizes all the inventory control models. The first model, economic order quantity or EOQ model, was the model that we covered the third lecture of the class where you have constant demand and this assumption of constant demand um, is very restrictive. It means you can have no fluctuations in demand. You have continuous review. You have unlimited capacity. You have holding and setup cost, um, but no back order cost. And, and because you have constant demand, obviously you're, you're not going to wind up um, in a situation where you miss, don't fill orders because you know what the demand's going to be. And when you have all of these conditions, the optimal policy is to order Q items when the inventory reaches a reorder point. Now, if we say that we no longer have constant demand but random demand, and we're looking at the problem periodically, and the capacity is unlimited, there's no holding, there's no setup cost, but there's holding and back order cost. The optimal policy is a P policy or news vendor policy that returns the inventory to a set level after each period. So I'll look at my problem as a series of individual periods. I'll order P items at the start of the period and, and that'll be the optimal policy. Today we're going to discuss the QR and the big S little s policy. Um, the QR policy has random demand during the lead time for orders. It's continuous. The capacity is unlimited and you consider both holding, setup, and back order cost. And the optimal policy is to order Q items whenever the inventory level hits R. Big S, little s policy basically the, is a periodic review policy. So we're, we're looking at it once a week instead of always looking at our inventory levels. And the optimal policy is to return the inventory to S if when we look at it, it's, it's less than little s. Now after the first test, we're going to discuss MRP, lot sizing, finite capacity scheduling, and Kanban Conwip. And all of these policies have, are driven by a forecast, and then Kanban Conwip is just one for one reordering of items. To get you ready for the test that is the first week of October, I want to do a brief review. Um, so far we've talked about the phases of product life cycle. So you have a startup phase and a, a growth phase and a maturation and a decline. And obviously the demand increases until you get to the maturation phase and then it declines in the decline phase. And that was discussed in the first lecture. We've talked about forecasting methods, the subjective forecasting method. Um, including Salesforce composition, where you ask the Salesforce, add up the individual responses and get an estimate. Customer survey, where you ask the customer. Jury of expert opinion, where you ask a group of experts. And then finally, Delphi method, where you ask a group of experts, take the estimate, give it back to them, and see if they change their opinion. We also talked about quantitative methods of forecasting, including exponential smoothing and moving average. And we discussed how to judge a forecast by mean squared error and mean absolute deviation. Expect one problem like the first homework assignment on exponential smoothing and moving average on the test. For those of you who have not taken one of my tests before, they tend to be hard by curve a lot. So, so you may think you're doing quite poorly on the exam, but you may have one of the highest grades in the class. Um, in terms of inventory, know the types of inventory, raw materials, components, work in process and finished goods. And remember that work in process costs typically more to, st to hold per item than either f than finished goods because it's taking up valuable space on your factory floor. Understand the reasons for holding inventory. You know, big reason is randomness. Randomness in demand, randomness in lead time. Another big reason is economics of scale. So to get quantity discounts or due to setups. Another potential reason would be speculation. Maybe you think the price is going to rise. Um, understand the characteristics of an inventory system, the, 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 which are given in the first slide. 
the pattern of demand, whether or not it's continuously reviewed or periodically reviewed, um, whether it's capacity restricted, setup cost, holding cost, back order cost, and then just how the policy is implemented. And then understand the relevant cost of inventory. Um, why, why does it cost us money to hold inventory? Well, one is the time value of money, the cost of capital. Another is storage cost. Another is the depreciation of the item or, or the, the deterioration of the quality of the item. Another is the risk of obsolescence. Now, for deterministic inventory, anticipate one or two questions on the EOQ. Um, know how to, for for I for undergraduates you don't know how to derive the EOQ but you need to know how to apply it to problems graduate students should be able to derive it um, be able to solve prob the basic EOQ EOQ with finite production understand how to set up problems with all unit discounts but I probably won't ask a question um, for ABC analysis just know what that is which is having a different policy for more expensive items that account for a higher percentage of your sales than those that account for a lower percentage um, we discussed how that may not be a good policy with modern computer systems you should treat probably all like items the same anticipate one question maybe on the news vendor problem and then today we're going to discuss type 1 type 2 service levels and the QR and and s big s little s models and then for the next four lectures we're going to talk about procurement and supply chain management and about forty percent of the test will be problems and the rest will be short answer and essay the qr policy is a generalization of the eoq that allows for random de demand we treat R as the level of on-hand inventory when we reorder, and Q is the order quantity to order. So customers demand items, take them from inventory. As soon as we hit the, the R level, we order Q. And we have the following assumptions, that it's continuously reviewed, so we're constantly looking at our inventory levels. The demand is random and stationary. There exists some lead time to get the item back and that we have a holding setup cost and order cost and then a stock out cost of P per unit of unsatisfied demand. So how does this policy work? Well when the inventory level reaches R we're just going to place an order for Q units that's going to arrive T units later. And when lead times are long R should be interpreted as an inventory position just like with the EOQ. Um, the QR policy discussed in the book assumes back orders when the number of units ordered is equal to demand. Um, similar models can be created with lost sales. And we can go through the math, and I don't think it's that important, but there, there, are, there are three terms in a QR model. There's the first, the holding cost term, the setup, and then this last term is new and not part of the EOQ. It's a cost um, for back orders. So it's basically the cost per unit back order times the likelihood of a unit being back ordered. And you, you can set up a series of equations and solve for them iteratively to find optimal values for Q and R. Now when we look at a real inventory system with random demand, you're going to have two types of service levels and they like to call them type one and type two. So first thing to notice is that the penalty cost P is often di di difficult to estimate. What's the cost um, of a customer coming into your store and not finding the sh a shirt that they wanted? Well, if they leave your store and they never come back, that would be an expensive cost because you would have lost the customer. Um, alternatively, they can leave your store and, and, and come back later. Um, which would be a slight cost or they can leave your store and buy it somewhere else but continue to shop at your store which would be just the lost profit on the shirt or alternatively they can buy a different shirt at your store they can substitute one shirt for another in which case the cost of, of being out of something is very low so an alternative way of instead of setting up a cost for stocking out is to set up a target so type 1 service 
um, is to choose R, which is your reorder point, which is very similar to safety stock, such that the probability of not stocking out in the lead time is equal to a specific value. So you could say that um, 8 out of 10 t cycles that I order parts, I'm not going to stock out. Type 2 service chooses Q and R such that the proportion of demand satisfied from stock equals a specific value. So this would say that I'm going to fill the orders of 90% of my customers. And the book goes through um, how to set Q and R based on type 1 and type 2 service. Type, two, type 1 service is, is lead time service. It's what's the chance that I cover that lead time without stocking out. And type 2 service is fill, fill rate restated. What is the fraction of the demand do we actually cover? In reality, inventory systems are typically set by the ERP or supply chain management system, and you got to work within the, the limits of those, those business systems. But these models can give us a good policy guideline. And here's an example of type 1 and type 2 service. So we've ordered this part 10 times and we've stocked out twice. And we lost 45 sales one time and 10 sales another time. Now, two of these 10 cycles, customers didn't have parts. So we had an 80% type 1 fill rate. Now, there were a total number of 145 units demanded and we filled all but 55. So our fill rate per unit, or our type 2 service level, was 96%. Now the final inventory policy, we're not going to discuss all that much, which is the, the, the S, big S, little s policy. And basically, the QR policy is, is a continuous review policy. So you're constantly looking at your inventory. Now, now this policy is a periodic review policy. So once a week, once a month, we'll look at the inventory and then make a decision about ordering. And let's define two levels, with little s being less than big S, and let you be the starting inventory at the beginning of the period. So when I look at my inventory, I have you. All the optimal policy does is says that if u is less than s, we're going to order s minus u, or order up to big S. So if u is less than little s, we'll order up to big S. If u is greater than s, we're not going to do anything. So, so if little s is 10 and we have 12, we'll just wait till next week or the, the next period. If u is 5 and s is 10, well then, and, and big S was 50, we would order 45 to get from 5 to 50. Computing the optimal values of little s and big S is typically difficult. Simulation can sometimes be used. Another policy that's commonly implemented in practice is a P policy based on the news vendor that we discussed last time. And this policy is just to order up to P items. Um, so I'll look at my inventory once a week and then set the, the, the inventory level to, to P. For instance, if the truck comes to my store once a day, Maybe I would say that um, you know I want two pallets worth of this item in the store at all times, and so as soon as I get one pallet in the store, I'll go ahead and order the second pallet. And due to transportation considerations, the truck's already coming to deliver to the store. Sometimes a P policy makes sense. This concludes this introduction into QR policy as well as P policy. Don't expect any test questions on, on QR other than what is the policy. Um, make sure to spend a little bit of time reading through this and understanding what inventory policy works best in what situation. Thank you.